as I'm sure everybody saw and or can see, um, I'm doing creature design. Um, as I said earlier, I'm working on my MFA in concept art for game dev. Uh, I got uh, started with working with AU through my involvement in uh, Beyond Skyrim's Morrowind team. And uh, that's really helped me get a lot of confidence and experience with doing this kind of thing. So uh, I'm not going to drag it out too much and talk about myself because y'all are here for something cooler than me. Um, obviously, what is creature design? You know, a lot of people think of, you know, massive, huge beasts, but honestly, it includes everything from, you know, the insects that are buzzing around or the birds that are flying, just anything that you experience in a game that is alive and part of the world has been designed by someone. Um, my very first claim for uh, Morrowind was the Arnesian Glasswing butterfly, and nobody's going to look as closely at it as a concept artist, but I needed to be sure that I communicated as much information as possible for whoever has to make it down the line, because there's kind of a, a balance between having a really cool idea and then having to work with the people down the pipeline who actually have to make it happen. <laughs> My part's the easy part. Um, on screen, you can see some of the more, well, some of what I think are the more iconic movie monsters and creatures that have been designed, and I think I've got the credits right. At least that's who they were credited as on IMDb. Uh, the Pale Man, obviously a creature of nightmares. Uh, anybody who's seen Pan's Labyrinth looked at that guy and went, no thank you. Um, he's one of the more humanoid uh, creatures that we've seen in cinema. He's, he's just human enough to make that slight otherness really unsettling. Uh, but then you get creatures like Motor from The Ritual uh, that have human elements, obviously. You can see the hands hanging down like mandibles. I don't know if you can tell the head is actually a human torso. Um, but they they have human elements that have been twisted beyond what we're willing to identify with in a way that makes them just absolutely jarring. We, we see parts of our own anatomy in it, but we can tell it's very, very wrong. And then you get stuff like the xenomorph that is not humanoid. It's not human. It's completely other. And that, that lack of seeing ourselves is what makes it kind of unsettling. Um, so, I mean, these are all kinds of different things you can keep in mind when you're doing creature design is, you know, the level of humanity, the level of identifying that your uh, your audience can do with the creature. Um, the really important thing for creature design, as with any other concept art, is research. I cannot overstate the importance of research when you are doing any kind of design work. Um, working from references will help ensure that you have believability and accuracy in your designs. Even if you're doing something that is absolutely off the wall, if you understand anatomy, if you understand proportion, if you understand shape language, it all helps feed into your awareness of how to design something that feels like it could exist. And I think that's one of the things that makes creature design successful is if it feels like something that could exist. Um, like, I'll, I'll have some examples later that I can get into, like, you know, how does it, how does it move? You know, what kinds of constraints are there with its anatomy and stuff like that? Um, this is a large block of text that basically comes down to Really, you should be doing research and using reference. I've met a lot of people who, when they first start, they kind of reject the idea of drawing from reference. 
And I think part of that is fear that their work won't be original enough or that they'll be seen as copying. But we do things like master studies for a reason. We, we go through those same steps so that we can learn the same processes. And like you know, whatever you have to do to learn, whatever works for you to improve your skills is what you have to do to learn. There's no shame in tracing if you need to trace to understand the proportions of something. You know, if, if I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do a study from a John Singer Sargent painting, I'm going to color pick and I'm going to do draw overs so that I get proportions correct and I make sure I have the right palette because I need to train myself to identify those things before I can find them from scratch. That is true no matter what you're doing. You know, if you need something that has the anatomy of a Komodo dragon, you're not going to eyeball it if you don't. If you haven't already put in the time to understand the anatomy of reptiles like that, you're not just going to sit there and wing it. Because, let me tell you, what's underneath that skin? Not always what you expect. Um, here are some examples of, like, reference materials that I'm kind of talking about. Um, the top photos are all photos that I took at the Museum of Osteology in Oklahoma. I live in North Texas, so it's a few hours drive, but it is well worth the drive if you can go to a museum, if you can go to something like this. If you can go to, like, a Bass Pro or a Cabela's, you can do studies from skeletal specimens. You can do taxidermy to start learning those forms. Um, and there's obviously no shortage of reference materials online, including, as you can see in the lower left, uh, the centaur anatomy that someone has sat and figured out. But in order to do that, they had to have a masterful grasp of human and equine skeletal and muscular structure. And that having that allowed them to fuse those things. Um, you know, some of the more common elements that we see in art are a lot of skeletal elements from familiar creatures. Um, I have that dog skeleton there. Uh... There's this very tiny ridge right here on a canid skull. As you can see, it's more pronounced up here on the gray wolf skull. Um, I just saw a hilarious tattoo thread uh, that was people who thought they were getting wolf skulls, but they don't have this ridge. And if you see a skull that looks like this without the ridge, it is a raccoon. And... Uh, there's a bunch of people out there with really cool raccoon skull tattoos because somebody didn't do their research along the way. Um, over here, I've got some diagrams of different types of wings and how they compare to a human arm because this can help inform how you design a flying creature. You know, do you want it to have the the fingers essentially be like a bat and spread out with a thumb? You know, do you want them to be somewhere between bird and bat? You know, do you want a harpy that has essentially the hand in place of that thumb without the fingers down here? If you know how things fit together, you can start fitting things together that wouldn't normally match. Um, one of the best ways that I have found to assemble all your research into a useful sort of board is, you know, a mood board. Um, I've been doing these all through grad school. They're so common. Um, and I don't think you can ever have too many. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I use Pure Ref because I had a mentor uh, show me that that existed, and I think it's super convenient. Um, Pinterest is super, super common even among other, like, my professors who all work in the game industry use it. There's, it's, it's very accessible. Um, you can, you know, you can save images and slap them together in Photoshop or paint. Just, you know, you can open a bunch of pictures all at once. It, 
is not a uh, th there's no one way to to put a put together a mood board. There's no one way to use your research and reference material. <laughs> you know, whatever works for you is the way to read it. So I have some examples here. Um, this is a Little Red Riding Hood mood board that I put together in Photoshop a few years ago. I have various references of wolf skulls at different angles. I have references of decay, um, some references from film, various uh, environment elements so that I can figure out kind of lighting and atmosphere. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a Pinterest board where I am hoping to be able to combine a uh, sort of like a siren centaur type creature that is part of the forest but absolutely a predator despite looking like potentially prey. Um, this was made in pure rough. This is obviously you can see examples of various skeletal elements. This is a I think Reeves Mudjak. Um, I think that's a white tail, a couple of different goat slash sheep. This is a human sacrum, this is a human spine, this is the way the spine curves and the ribs fold out. Uh, because I was thinking of somehow putting all of that together. And then my assignments picked up very quickly, so I have put that on the back burner. <laughs> um, when you are designing a creature, there are a lot of things to consider, and you don't have to necessarily consider every single thing for every single creature. But, you know, like, what does this creature do? You know, is it a pack animal? Does it tow a wagon? Is it meant to be a mount? Is it a pet? Is it a food source? Do you take it hunting? Is it, like, a wizard's familiar? Is it meant to be, like, a guard or an attack animal? Is it, you know, livestock? Is it just a wild animal? Is it a monster? What does it eat? Uh, where does it live? All of that will help inform your design, and I'm sure everyone has already learned this, but obviously with uh, regards to what it eats, your teeth designs will uh, communicate that. So we have a carnivore, has all the pointed teeth, has to rip, has to tear, doesn't really chew. We have an omnivore, has to be able to do those things, but is more likely to chew. And then you have an herbivore that has, you know, the, the weird creepy front teeth, but then it has the teeth specifically set for grinding, because it's going to be grinding up plant pulp, basically. Um, all of those things can contribute to your design to help communicate something about your creature that people may not even realize they're internalizing when they view it. Um, as for how you get good at creature design, definitely helps to already have a basic drawing foundation, to have a, a decent grasp of shape and form language, to have a grasp of anatomy, both form and function, for people and animals, although if you get human figures down, that does help inform any kind of animal muscular and skeletal structure. Um, if you understand motion, like the limitations of limbs, how certain things move, that will carry you a long way. And then obviously doing all of this helps inform your creative instincts, which helps sort of hone your reflexive response to how to design something. Um, unfortunately, there is no shortcut for this, just like with any other drawing, the secret is, in fact, time and work. Uh, I recommend doing drawing studies of things that help build a foundation. I always recommend starting with skeletal structure because that is the, the framework that everything stands on. Um, muscles can help inform, you know, where are the lumps under the skin? Why is something shaped this way? How does it move? How does it not move? Um, I recommend studies of plants, especially some of the more exotic plants, because you can cross those with pre-existing animals and or other plants to create features that you might not expect. Um, or uh, I did a bunch of 
um, sea sponges for Morrowind. And I went through and I looked up sea sponges and I looked at the plants around my house and I was like, okay, sea sponge, but what if also pitcher plant? And then, you know, you get people who combine things like pitcher plants with the concept of an animal and you get things like Pokemon. You get um, things like Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horror. Um, so you can combine plants and creatures, and you can get some pretty interesting results. Um, I recommend studying organs, because one of the fastest ways to make something creepy when you're designing it is to have some kind of exposed organ, or have an implication of an organ near to the surface of the skin, because that just... We know instinctively that that's not okay. Like, that's not how our anatomy is supposed to be. So if we see, like, a beating heart underneath some stretched skin, our instinct is to be like, oh, no, no, no. Um, texture is obviously important because, you know, fur, scales, whatever you want to call octopus skin, stuff like that. You, you need to know how to communicate those things so that whoever's down the pipeline from you in game dev can be sure to communicate those things properly and not have to come back to you, you know, every five minutes and be like, hey, how is this supposed to look? Uh, and that's part of the reason you do drawing callouts sometimes, too, is you just you zoom in and you show, okay, here, this is what it's supposed to look like up close. Um... Part of the anatomy is limbs and extremities because nobody likes to draw hands. A lot of people don't like to draw forelimbs for a lot of the same reason. And uh, sometimes you just, you gotta sit down and do it. It sucks, but that's the only way to get through it. Um, color and color theory are important, but everything else should come first. Color should be the like last thing on your mind. Uh, these are some examples uh, from the Museum of Osteology, various trips that I went on, uh, from skeletal specimens that I own, from school. Uh, I had to do various uh, skeletal and various animal studies, plant studies. Um, sometimes when you are doing creature design, you will have to draw something you really don't want to draw. I have not insignificant arachnophobia, but I was not going to put less effort into this spider than I did into this scarab or this cardinal. I, I was going to make sure that if I had to draw it, it was going to be good work, basically, because just because it scares me doesn't mean I can't do it. Um, and then sometimes you have to get a little bit creative when you're doing creature design. These are technically props, uh, because they were for an assignment that, uh, involved finding increasingly, uh, decayed remains in a forest. But, uh, if I hadn't done the studies of animals and structures of their skeletons and muscles, I wouldn't have been able to put these props together. So creature study lent itself to this. And doing any kind of study like this, this can just be quickly translated into a prop, you know? Oh, I need a I need a sheep skull. Okay, I've got a sheep skull. I can just convert that to a different format. I can redraw it at a different angle, whatever I need to do. I've already done it once. I have that understanding. Um when it comes to actually designing creatures, um, referencing folklore and mythology can come up with so many different things. Like, you can interpret the same creature multiple different ways. There are so many iterations on, like, griffins. Because, you know, we traditionally think of, like, the lion-eagle-type griffin. But one of my favorites I've ever seen was a snow leopard and a snowy owl. And that completely changes the tone of the creature. It looks more mysterious. It looks just a little bit cooler to me. Um, but if you are going to 
use any kind of mythological creature, if you're going to pull from uh, folklore or particularly religious mythology, make sure that you are paying proper respect to the cultures that you are drawing those from. A lot more cultures are still living cultures than a lot of people realize, and it can be extremely disrespectful to, you know, just decide I'm going to make my own version of this sacred creature or being that doesn't account for any of the cultural aspects of it. So just watch out for that. Try not to be gauche. Um, when it comes to getting ideas, you know, ask your friends, family, peers, you know, ask here, what are some animals you can combine? What are parts of animals you can combine? Uh, you can uh, also use online generators. I will uh, drop this link uh, somewhere where everybody can access it. It just gives you a sample prompt, and then you work from what you get. Um, these are some creature designs that I have done. The frog, the snake, and the uh, Volpertinger were all done as sprites for a platformer that I just finished working with. Um, this is the Arnesian glasswing butterfly that I got to do. Uh, I did the pony guar, which has this, like, frill underneath. Hello. Uh, to emulate, like, a, a mane on a pony. Um, this was my original design for the dew stag, but it had to be altered to be more grasshopper-like so that it could fit the ash hopper skeleton. Um, and then sometimes you get... Just the worst things recommended to you. Sometimes your husband walks up to you and says, Hey, can you draw some pictures of some creatures I made up for our upcoming campaign? And you say, Yes, of course I can. Let me see them. And you're expecting something very cool or very cute. And then you have the what I have dubbed the no thank you ball uh, based on his description. This is, in fact, what he, uh, what he asked for. And he's more upset with it than I am, which serves him right. But one of the things that allowed me to make this so upsetting was my understanding of human anatomy. So I went through, you know, and I showed the veins under the flesh. I showed the areas that tend to be a little redder because of the way our blood flow works. You know, I have the extremely deformed but still readable lips and the very human eyes, the stubbly eyebrow flaps, just all having been drawn from real understanding of anatomy, have allowed me to make this extremely upsetting creature. Um, and then sometimes you just get really, really not so clear direction and you have to take some liberties because when you hear eye stocks but also still real eyes you just have to decide you know is it gonna look like a new year's headband with all the springs is it gonna have you know uh can it actually focus with its main eyes you know it's got rows of teeth are those rows of human teeth? Are those rows of shark teeth? Um, it has a long, tube-like mouth that extends from its false mouth, a lot like a xenomorph, but how far? How tube-like? You know, is it wrinkly? Is it fleshy? Is it solid? And uh, sometimes you just you have to make calls, and when you're done, you look at the creature, and you go... Why? Why did I do this? But it's too late, you've already done it. Um, using the generator that I mentioned on the last page, I came up with a sample prompt, and it gives you like a little scenario, kind of like, almost as if it's a choose-your-own-adventure type thing. So the prompt here that I was given is a cross between a Tasmanian tiger and a moonfish with vibrant colors. So... Uh, I looked up Tasmanian tigers because I only have skeletal references for them from the Museum of Osteology and I needed to see their fur. 
and I looked up a moonfish because I had no idea what that was because I am from Iowa and we don't really have water. Um, and it lives in general, like, grassland plains, so I just grabbed a random photo. But uh, this is the combination that we ended up with, the general form of a Tasmanian tiger with a sort of mane and fringe that emulates the sunfish or the moonfish fins and then uh cooler coloring that kind of has iridescence to it and a little bit of a scale like patterning to harken back to the moonfish um it was a pretty quick design um i have uh, process videos of all of these drawings because I uh, did most of them in Procreate, which I will happily upload uh, to my long disused YouTube channel if anybody ever wants to see how I go about actually working on something like that. Uh, sped up because it can take time. And uh, if I have gone through any of this too quickly if you want me to go back to any slides i absolutely will um i had planned for during like a q a session to be working on a design so uh i asked for some suggestion examples and i got uh a horse a panther a dog an alpaca a polar bear and an octopus and the triangular structure of this slide, while also being part of the template that I used, helped me kind of figure out which parts of which animal I'm going to put where. So I've decided to try to go with the head of a horse, body of a panther, probably like haunches, rear haunches of a dog. Uh, I'm going to try to figure out alpaca and polar bear legs. And then the uh, the octopus is kind of a kind of a wild card. It can go wherever I decide I want it. So I'm going to switch over to my uh, open uh, Photoshop document, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and open it up for Q and A. I know I went through fast again. If you want me to to go over anything again, I'm happy to do so. I'm happy to go back to any of the slides. I'm just going to do a creature design task while I'm here so everyone can kind of see how it works. Sorry, hang on. Hi, I have a question. Yes. Um, when it comes to creature design, does any part of that design overlap with like its behavior or its kind of routines, like kind of bringing it to life instead of just designing it? Um, a lot of times, if I'm doing more involved creature design, uh, I will think about you know how does it move, how does it breathe. You know, what is it like when it's stationary? Uh, and I will try to make notes about those things. Um, so there are a couple of creatures, particularly the uh, the no thank you ball that I drew, that I have a lot of notes. Uh, also, you can't see, but I have a reference board of animals pulled up, just in case anyone thinks I am pulling this out of my ass. I am not. Um... But uh, bringing it to life is something that you, especially when you're working on uh, on a game or on a mod or something, you have to work with the people down the pipeline who will be responsible for producing it to help communicate what that means. I promise it will not look like this too long. Uh, and I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question. I uh, I have ADHD. 
and no meds right now. So I am definitely crying. Sorry, Can you tell us a bit about what you're drawing? Well, well, uh, I don't know who was first. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, no, that uh, answer makes sense. So, sorry, I just spaced out for a bit, too. No, that's okay. I get it. Um, as for what I'm drawing, I, uh, I'm trying a couple of different things out right now. I know I want the the horse-shaped head, and then I want at least uh, a long enough neck for it to, you know, be able to move its head, and then move into the panther body, which is kind of like a squarish potato. Um, and I want it to have those really, really uh, strong shoulders. Uh, because I think the idea of a horse-like predator is nightmarish and will be fun to draw. Um, currently, I have what might be a tentacle for a tail. I don't think I'm going to keep it. Um, I uh, Part of what I'm doing is, you'll see I started with blue and I started on a multiply layer so that I can read it better. I usually work on a gray background because it's easier on my eyes because I spend a lot of time working at a screen. Um, and I definitely need to be as gentle with my eyes as I possibly can because I'm already very blind. <laughs> uh, I do this in layers where I kind of feel out what I'm doing. Uh, so, uh, part of the weird lumps and lines that you see me doing is accounting for the skeletal structure that I know is underneath of uh, these various creatures. I haven't specifically studied a, uh, a panther or an alpha Haka, but I have studied a llama and various other big cats, and horses are pretty common around here. Um, I uh, I'm trying to think of a posing profile right now, so that I can think about how it looks while it's moving. Um, and part of the way that I am going to distinguish things like the polar bear forelimbs from the panther body is uh, the presence of the claws, because big cats can retract their claws, and most other things can't. Uh, and I know I want it to have a very broad chest, because I know that the, the way the... Uh, uh, skeletal structure is shaped is very sweeping in here and I know that the uh, uh, skeletal structure in the leg and stuff helps make it very broad um, so I'm doing a little bit of like anatomical laying so that I can make sure I have uh, some vague accuracy. Um, one thing I always underestimate is how broad a horse's jaw is. And uh, that always takes me by surprise when I double check. Um, so right now I feel like I have the head a little too disproportionately uh, large for the body that I have. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to try to resize and move some stuff around. See if I can't uh, give it a little stronger neck. More like a sphinx or something. 
and uh, get those holes in there. Um, and uh, the pose that I am kind of going with is one that I've seen on uh, various like uh, winged lion statues. Um, so I think that pose will work. And then I just come in here and I play with the proportions till I have something that I'm happy with. That'll do. Um, one of the simultaneously nice things and struggles of creature design is that there's not really anyone who can tell you uh, you know, oh, anatomically, that should be this proportion, because no one in their right mind would look at these things and be like, yeah, of course, those things all fit together naturally. But, uh, you know, right now I've got, like, the corgi proportioned creature here. Um, can you not? Uh, so I am trying to fix that. But with one portion of the body at a time, just because I find that easier. Um, when I am first doing a sketch, there is a lot of trial and error, I guess you could say. Uh, I'll put stuff down, and then I'll decide I don't like it, and that'll be scrapped. Uh, depending on what program I'm working in, sometimes I will leave the layer and just hide it in case I change my mind. Because sometimes you spend four hours on a on a thing you decide you don't want to keep and you go back to an earlier version. And I like to work as non-destructively as possible. So I tend to save layers and uh, try to work above them. Hey, uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so since you mentioned the corgi propor proportions, what do you think of the vanilla Skyrim saber cats? Because I always thought they were very weirdly proportioned. They're... I guess the word that I would think of would be kind of like stumpy. <laughs> um... I don't know how they're supposed to be such good predators. I cannot imagine that thing running <laughs> if it was real. Uh, one of the things that like makes it hard is if you look at like real world big cats um, they are a little different than we sometimes expect like snow leopards not that much bigger than a domestic dog but they are little round fluff balls they don't look like they could hardly move but give one the space and it will prove you otherwise um, I've always thought bobcats just look like fat, wild, feral cats, but there, uh, there aren't a lot of things that I would be upset to meet in the wild than a bob, more upset to meet than a bobcat, because I have seen what those can do, and it is horrifying. So, I mean, like, sometimes physique doesn't necessarily match up with functionality. Um, I, uh, I always try to make it look a little more practical, um, just because that makes somebody else's job easier, usually. Uh, but, uh, some of the, some of the best evidence against intelligent design is things that already exist like you look at it and you're just like how did that how did that get to live 
And uh, sometimes it's by being deceptively chubby and round and disproportionate. But also still being able to murder you. All right. Thanks. Here. I feel like the head is still enormous, but you know what? I'm just, I'm starting to just vibe with it. <laughs> uh, haven't drawn bear paws in a while, so I'm trying not to make them too feline. Um, I guess I could reverse them. I could try having the paws in the back. I could try having the hooves in the front. I think no matter what, gonna have to just work with some exaggerated proportions. One of the problems is that horses are generally relatively lean, unless you're looking at like a, a labor horse, and uh, that is not what I have a picture of. <laughs> Uh, and things like panthers are kind of stout and very stocky. Um, so trying to fuse that with one another is a little bit tricky. Um, there we go. Get some nice big old toesies in there. Sometimes you have to stop and you have to think, okay, I have the real photo in front of me, but... What if I just do this slightly cartoonish thing? What if I exaggerate this a little differently? And sometimes that helps. Uh, you know, sometimes you uh, you want to draw a terrifying monster, but realistically, like practically for your purposes, it has to have like toe beans, or it doesn't make physical sense. Uh, I have ended up uh, tucking the belly up in here a little bit more like a horse rather than like a panther. But I can raise the shoulder more like a predator and I can keep the back kind of straight. And then uh, I haven't really decided how I'm going to attack the tail yet, so it's just kind of going to a little floppy tail right now. I do think I am going to have those tentacles as a mane, so I may even pull those down into the tail. Um, sorry, I just... Sometimes I get distracted while I'm putting things together. Um, I know alpacas are part of the camelid family. Camelids have split toes. So I know we get woven hooves. Um, you do not have to go out and study taxonomy. I just happen to be interested in biology uh, and read all of those little plaques at museums when I am there doing studies. Uh, okay. I no longer need those two. So once I'm ready to kind of try to go in and do a little bit more of a uh, more finalized sketch, I'll start getting in a little further. Uh, I try to work very zoomed out because I don't want to get bogged down on any one feature. And then, you know, pull out and realize I've got that awful proportion. Um, let's see here. Horses have very nice eyelashes, I believe. 
but also kind of that big cat sort of tilt. Um, I'm going to go with large round pupil rather than slitted or anything else, just because I think that makes it a little, little less awful. I think I'm going to go for uh, a not-so-terrible creature here. Um, it's got its brow line in there, down the nose, big old floppy nostrils, floppier lips. I don't know a lot about horses, like horse anatomy with skin, because I have mostly done uh, osteological studies, but I I know enough to know that they have big floppy lips, so I'm just going to exaggerate those a little. Um, I know that the jaw is enormous. Um, the chin may be a little small one. Don't know. I can always decide that later. It helps add an element of personality. Um, let's see here. I'm going to give myself a real light line here so that I can have a neck to work with without getting stuck so that I have to erase stuff for the, the tentacles. Um, I feel like I was going to going to say something about all the different steps I was doing, but, like, I don't know. I got sidetracked by Tobians. I want it to kind of have that, uh, like, proud posture. With that just stocky polar bear leg. One of the things that I haven't considered is uh, how this is going to be textured. Uh, everything but the octopus has fur, which means that I can probably rely on being able to put fur on. But, uh, you know, there are so many color variations for dogs and horses and alpacas that, you know, I could choose to have it be a little more domestic and cutesy. I could choose to have it look, you know, like a fancy species, like glistening white coat and all between the, the polar bear and the alpaca and stuff. Uh, and this is still a pretty, pretty rough stage. Uh, once I get a, uh, a sketch working, then I usually build it up in multiple layers. Uh, and I obviously won't be able to finish this entire thing in this time, but I will definitely share the the finished product when it's done. I uh I'm still probably going to go back and attack the proportions quite a bit more and see if I can't get some muscularity without making it look stocky. Uh I'm thinking multiple tentacles for the tail, honestly. I think that's uh the way I gotta go. And you know, if I really wanted to get awful, I could put that big old octopus head on the back of his skull. Which I don't like at all. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes you have ideas that you suspect are gonna be bad, but it's good to sketch them in anyway, just so you can see. Uh, I honestly recommend trying whatever comes to mind when you're doing this because you never know you know, the dumb idea that you think, oh no, there's no way this will work. That might be exactly the thing you needed. And 
if you don't try, if you don't let go of the idea that it has to be perfect on the first go, then you're never going to really progress with it. Uh, and concept art is all about iteration. It's all about having to do it over and over again and change things. So, like, if I wanted to continue forward with this as a feature, I would then proceed to do a complete redesign of, like, the next structure. The, the skull would be, like, it would still stop back here, but then you'd have all this extra skin and flesh and organs to account for. And you, uh, you'd have to rethink that. And it really, it, it can create a place where things branch. And when things branch, then you can get some really different ideas that are variations on the same thing. And that can help inform the, the process and help give whoever you're working with ideas that will help feed your ideas. And it just creates a, uh, a loop and you you work together and you get what you're ultimately after. Done with a less UT profile for this layer, trying to get something that looks even moderately respectable. <laughs> um, I've puffed out the chest, which is a little bit more of like a uh, a canine feature, but uh, I think it adds dignity to the design. And you just just keep working over and over again until you get the thing to where it is what you want. So, like, I have a pretty pretty solid uh, foundation. I like this. I like this profile. I like this attitude. Uh, so I want to shrink that down so I have more room to work. Um, and then bring that torso back. Get that big cat sort of muscle structure but also the, well, big cat. I mean, the, the universal cat bag. And then I think we're going to have the back legs be shaggy and fluffy, so you won't quite see the whole hooves. And, uh, you know, have those bare arms. And have it kind of poised like it's looking at something alert. And then you can always kind of test the waters so to speak, when it comes to the overall shape of something like tentacles, if you rough it out with very fine lines, you can end up with the, the profile that you want. And you can choose to break that in the middle. You can choose to have it come wind around. You can choose to have it fan out, curl back. Um, They're going to be pretty easy to to work with because they're basically going to function like a mane, which gives you a lot of the same functionality as hair. Um, I have found that the distort tool is one of my favorite tools. Uh, because it helps me get things positioned where I want them. It helps me determine uh, a little better, like, the angles I want things at. 
So I have this very rough design. Uh, it will have tentacles for a mane. Uh, I will have to decide whether I'm going to follow like a traditional horse mane or if I want to compare it to something like um, like an Akata um, from, uh, I guess most recently I saw it in the Pathfinder Bcary, um, because they also have like tentacle manes, but uh, I'm thinking for this guy's purposes, having a very sweeping and graceful tentacle mane. <laughs> Sounds very weird to say. Uh, sorry, I keep coughing. Uh, I think this will help him look a little cooler and less ridiculous. Because when you get a list of animals like this, it can be very ridiculous. <laughs> um, you know, I can start thinking a little bit about how am I going to want that coloration to work? You know, do I want it to have, like, octopus patterning? Do I want it to be, uh, you know, do I want it to have, like, dog or paint horse patterning? I'm looking at a paint Mustang for the reference. Um, you know, do I want to have it uh, open its mouth? Do I want to show like panther teeth you know do i want it to be a predator do i want it to be an omnivore and just uh gonna have to make some of those decisions along the way and whatever i end up with again i will share the final product so everybody can see uh more than just the initial stages because this is only layer six and I often work in hundreds of layers, so uh, I'm not going to ask anyone to sit and suffer through that, ever. But uh, yeah, if there's any other questions, I'm, time's just about up. No it questions. It looks magnificent. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm uh, I'm thinking I might end up putting some kind of like harness or something on it. I think it might be a mount, maybe like a cavalier mount. Well, thank you all for uh, for being here. Thank you all for listening to me.